Hey everyone, and welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. Tonight we are talking about the doctrine of sin. Uh, my wife and I uh, enjoy watching TV shows together. I think most couples uh, do. And so over the years we have accumulated uh, a set of favorites, and you always remember memorable lines and scenes and things like that. And they, they get brought up in conversation uh, as shorthand for... Uh, expressing some form of emotion. A lot, a lot of folks do this. I'm sure you have this even within your family, a favorite movie, a funny line, that when something specific happens in your life, somebody in your family is going to quote whatever that is. And so uh, sometimes when I am uh, being being a little bit annoying or uh, I say something, I'm a big fan of dad jokes or making puns. Uh, and so when I do something like that, my wife will often look at me and, and quote one of our favorite TV shows and, and look at me and say, why are you the way that you are, right? Uh, some of you, you may know this is from The Office, but why are you the way that you are? And that's really what we're, we're talking about tonight with the Doctrine of Sin. Why are you the way that you are? Why am I the way that I am? Why is the world the way that it is? Uh, as, a, as somebody who's not only a pastor, but also a historian, uh, that's one of the things that I always am surprised by uh, when, I, when I read in various eras in history is that so much has changed, and yet uh, so much is exactly the same. There are the same problems that we face, uh, and they've been faced by people down through history. Uh, certainly pandemics are unusual, though there have been pandemics before. Uh, but a lot of the things that characterize the difficulties in your life and mine, dealing with difficult people, dealing with our own uh, inability to do the things that we know we ought to do, or our own inability to, uh, to stay away from the things that we should, those are, those are things that characterize history. Uh, and sometimes when I hear folks talk about how the world right now is uh, more messed up than it ever has been, in some ways I think they're right, but then in, in other ways it's, that's also not true at all. Uh, the world has, has just found different ways to continually mess itself up, and what we're asking tonight is, is why is that? Why has humanity over history not just sort of continued to improve and ascend, right? Uh, technology improves. There are various aspects of life that improve for sure. But why is it that selfishness hasn't been fixed? Why, why do people still commit adultery in 2021 uh, in the same way that they did in 796? Why is that? Why, why do you still have to teach children not to lie? Why do you still have to teach adults not to lie? Why is it that the powerful still pray on the weak? Why, why do we have Bible verses written in the BCs that deal with that? And we also see it in our world today. Why is racism still an issue? It's addressed in the New Testament. Why are these things not fixed? The answer to that is found in the doctrine of sin. Now, sin is a three-letter word that many of us, if you've been in church, you have some sort of concept of what sin is. Uh, what's, I always find it's, it's interesting to ask that question, what is sin? Uh, because we tend to define it in different ways. It's actually a very broad category. So uh, I'm going to give you a definition if you're taking notes. Uh, this, this comes from something called the, excuse my phone, uh, the New City Catechism, which is, pulls from a, a lot of historical, basically Sunday school curriculum down through the ages. And it defines sin like this. Sin is rejecting or ignoring God in the world he created, right? So rejecting or ignoring God in the world he created, because we exist in, in his world. And so rejecting or ignoring God in the world he created, not being or doing what he requires in his law, right? So altogether, sin is rejecting or ignoring God in the world he created, not being or doing what he requires in his law. So there's a rejection of God or an ignoring of God as a, as a person, his existence, his authority, because we live in, in his world. But then there's also a rejection uh, to, to do what he requires of us in his law. You can think the Ten Commandments here. But there's something much deeper. We're not the people we're supposed to be. It's not just that we don't do the right things. It's also that we're not the right people. Our hearts don't want the right things. One of the things that I find myself often praying uh, when trying to repent of sin and see change in my own life, I, I ask the Lord not just to help me do the right thing, but to help me want to. I'm asking Him really to fix my desires. Because not only do I not do the right things, but I'm, I'm not the person that God's law says that I should be. 
So that's what sin is. It's a really big, broad category to describe what is wrong with us and what's wrong with our world. All of this has happened because we've rejected God and we're not uh, the people that we should be. And we don't do the things that we should do uh, as laid out with his law. Uh, scripture in Genesis chapter 3 uses a term for this. It tells us how we got here. And that term is curse. Right? Curse is a, a word that we we start hearing right about now in Walmart uh, as Halloween is approaching. Fall is here. This is officially the first day of meteorological fall, uh, which consists of September, October, and November. So congratulations, you made it to pumpkin spice season. But uh, that's uh, that's what's going on actually during scripturally the fall, which is Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve sin and everything falls apart. Uh, there is something called the curse that comes in. If you look at your Bible in Genesis chapter 3, you'll see this laid out, the effects of the curse. So Adam and Eve sin, they rebel against God. Uh, God created them, he told them what they should do, and they did the opposite of that. They rejected his authority, right? They did not do what he required. And so as a result of that, everything falls apart, and God curses not only mankind, but the world. And you can read about the effects of that in Genesis 3. We talked about them a little bit last week when it came to the way we relate to one another as men and women. But what's important to note is that it's not just we who are cursed, it's also creation. Romans 8 tells us that creation along with us is eagerly waiting for the end of this curse. So God curses us. He says that work will be difficult, childbirth will be painful, uh, that it's by the sweat of our brow that we'll eat, that animals are no longer uh, you know, going to, to, to be those who help. They're, they're a danger to us. The creation itself is falling apart. In science, there's something called uh, the second uh, law of thermodynamics. Entropy is, is what we uh, sometimes call this uh, shorthand, the law of entropy. Basically says this, it's very intellectual and erudite. Things fall apart. That's, that's the second law of thermodynamics, entropy, that systems move from order to disorder, that naturally things don't organize themselves. Naturally, they fall apart. There's a series that the Discovery Channel did a few years ago um, about uh, life after humans, sort of imagining that if the apocalypse happened, nobody was here, what would happen? And surprise, surprise, um, the streets didn't clean themselves and buildings didn't maintain themselves. Things rot. They fall apart. That's the second law of thermodynamics. That's the effect of the curse, that everything is falling apart, uh, including us. And so curse is really important to understand for this reason. Sometimes uh, we as Christians can maybe be a bit too optimistic isn't the right word, but we can expect things of the world and expect things of people that are not realistic according to Scripture. So anytime that we look at lost people, the lost world, things that happen in politics, things that happen um, with, with lost people, and we sort of throw up our hands and go, I can't believe that they would do that. We are failing to understand that the world we live in and we as people are, are also under the curse of God. Because when we throw up our hands in frustration and say, I can't believe they, they don't see this, what we're failing to remember is that it's, it's not a matter of education. It's not a matter of us just knowing the right things to do. We are under the curse of God. Things are not going to go as we feel they should. That's the effect of sin. That's the effect of the fall. We are under a curse. And so we want the wrong things. We don't do the right things. And that's the default state. Really, we should probably be surprised that things are as good as they are, given the sinfulness of, of the human heart and given the seriousness of the curse. This is why people die. Sin entered the world, Romans says, through one man, and by one man all men sin. And death entered as a result of sin. Right? So the wages of sin is death. So this is uh, the problem of sin. Right? It's a big problem. It's not just that we choose the wrong stuff. Right? Uh, I heard a mom say one time that every time her kids left her house, she yelled after them, make good choices. And that's good, good parental advice. But our problem is much bigger than just making the wrong choices. There's something wrong with our hearts. We are under the curse um, as a reminder of the seriousness of our rebellion against God. So lots of different ways we can sin. Theologians kind of come up with lists of kinds of sins. So I'm just going to list some of them here because really what I want us to understand is sin is not just, well, I shouldn't have eaten that uh, candy bar 
Uh, I knew I shouldn't have done it. It wasn't mine. I stole it. Therefore, I was wrong. That, that's not the only kind of sin, right? There are sins of ignorance. So God has commanded us uh, to do certain things and to not do certain things. And we do those things, and lots of people do those things without even knowing that God has commanded us not to do good. You can sin and not know it. Sin is not just not doing stuff you, you know you shouldn't do. There are sins of ignorance. There are sins of error, wrong ways of thinking, right? I didn't know the Bible said that. I thought that was, that was okay. That was not okay. I, I was under the impression it was. That's error, right? You can sin by having a deficiency of knowledge, by thinking about things in the wrong way. We see this a lot sometimes with, with folks that like to correct other people, uh, especially in the church. There's a lot of self-righteousness that comes from knowing the Bible, having access to the Bible, knowing what God has said. Uh, and so this is why Jesus tells us that we're to take the log out of our own eye before we take the speck out of another, because we can know that someone is wrong and still go about correcting them in a sinful way. We can make an error in our thinking, right? We think, oh, they're wrong. Therefore, I can just, man, crush them, right? That would be an error in our thinking. We, we're thinking about how to correct somebody the wrong way. So sins of ignorance or sins of error, there's sins of inattention uh, by, by, by just not putting enough emphasis on the things that we should. We're not paying attention to the things that we should. Like when, when fathers are commanded to raise their children in the admonition of the Lord, there's a lot of stuff going on. We're really busy. And so it's not that we intended to not train our children to know the Lord or to have Bible study with them or to tell them about Jesus. We just got really busy and we didn't pay enough attention to that. That's sin. Sins of inattention. Sins of missing the mark. Sometimes you'll hear, you know, sin, one of the words for sin in the Old Testament has to do with like an archer missing the mark. And that's that's true. Uh, that we, man, we were trying our best. We just didn't didn't measure up. We did the wrong thing. We, we just missed the mark. We didn't do what God said to do. Best intentions. It's still sin. Uh, there is outright rebellion. Ah, God, I know what you said, but I don't want to do that. I want to do something else. That outright rebellion. I know what to do and I don't do it. There's perversion. There's there's the taking and the twisting of, of things that God has said are good, things that we should do, and, and perverting them, corrupting them towards our own ends, right? Think about, I don't know, the, the classic example here is gossip, where, man, we, we know that we're to pray for one another, that we're to bear one another up. Uh, that we're to lift one another up, intercede for one another, and yet how tempting is it? Because we all like to feel like, man, we are not the most messed up person on the, in the world. That's a good feeling to have. So how often does that turn into, yeah, you know, we should, we should so-and-so is going through a really tough time. I don't, I don't know if you knew about that, but yeah, this is happening in their life and we just need to pray for them. And really what's going on there is we're, we're perverting something God has, has said that we should do is good, pray for one another, and we turned it into a opportunity to gossip and to, to lift ourselves up at the expense of others' reputation. There's all sorts of uh, other ways we could describe sin. There's sense of abomination, right? So uh, not not just that we knew what to do and we didn't do it or we did something we shouldn't have, but we did expressly the worst possible thing we could do given what God has said, right? Um, sexual sin is often described in this way because our bodies are made by God. They're holy. And so when we sin, we're, we're sinning uh, against ourselves, we're sinning against our body. It's a, it's a special kind of class of sin. So sometimes sins are called abominations for that reason. Just to kind of sum all this up, I'm going to read something that Owen Strand said. Uh, he said that the whole human race has become sinful. We see this in Romans 3, 10 through 18. We are totally depraved. None of us does good by nature. From birth, we are depraved, haters of God, not doing what is right. Sin is not just action, but thought, desire, instinct, inclination, and urge. The book of James talks about this in James 1, where uh, James tells us that each one of us sins when we're led astray by our own desires, our own evil desires. And then we do those desires, and that gives birth to sin. And sin gives birth to death. And Strand continues, even as Christians, uh, we have to battle against sin daily. We have to confess it to God, repent of it, and claim the blood of Christ. Ultimately, the scope of sin, how broad a thing this is, means that we are totally unable to save ourselves. What, what Strand is getting at there is that um, sin is much bigger than just making some bad choices. It, it colors and touches every aspect of, of who we are and what we do. And now I want to provide a point of clarification here. He said something that I think is really important. He said we are totally depraved. Uh, and what sometimes I run into is uh, a, a difficulty for Christians when we think about the lost world because there are nice people who are lost. There are kind people who are lost. 
there are people who are lost that love their neighbor and do good things and do good deeds. And so, like, are they just kind of covering their devils in disguise and all of their, their good stuff that they do is really just a mask for wickedness? I don't think so. To say that we are totally depraved is not the same thing as saying we are utterly depraved. To say we are totally depraved means that totally all of our life is touched by depravity in one way or another. There isn't an area of your life or mine that, that sin doesn't tint right? Like if you've ever seen, like if I were to hold up a, I don't know, I don't have anything around here that would do this, but like a blue lens, right? You would still see a picture of me, but there'd be blue in it, touching every area. That's that's what depravity, that's what sin is for all of us. We are totally depraved, meaning that all of us is affected. All of our existence is affected, but we are not utterly depraved. In other words, we are not the worst we possibly could be. Every aspect of our lives is affected by sin, but we are not the worst we possibly could be. Matthew talks about this. There's something called common grace. The fact that God uh, allows it to rain on both the wicked and the innocent. We, we are not completely and utterly as wicked as we possibly could be. We're not utterly depraved, but we are totally depraved. We are affected by sin in every, every area of our life. If all that went over your head, here's the point. There is nothing that you and I can do to fix ourselves. The problem is too far gone. There's a comedian named Brian Regan who just, he was in, he's not a Christian comedian, he's just a comedian, uh, but he was talking about um, medical procedures and he said, you know, like he doesn't like to go to the doctor and, you know, if he had a cannonball wound, right, that's just a huge cannonball wound, he'd be like putting some ointment on it and a Band-Aid, right? That's a good picture of why the doctrine of sin matters because what we have is a cannonball wound. We have a problem that is so huge, we can't fix it. It doesn't matter how many self-help books we read, we can't fix it. We need to be saved, right? We need someone outside of us who is able to save us. And this is why one of my favorite um, pictures of the gospel is Jesus as the one who bears our curse. Galatians says that he, he became a curse for us. So we have been cursed by God, right? As a result of our sin, leads to death. We are under God's judgment. And yet Jesus, who did not sin, is crucified. He suffers the penalty of the curse, death, for us, so that for us in Christ, we can be set free from the curse of sin, right? You see this, Paul says this again and again, you can be set free from the curse of the law, right? We can be set free from, from the effects of the curse, which means having been set free in Christ, we are actually able to do good works. Ephesians 2 says this. We're looking at that this week, actually, that God has prepared good works for us. So we're no longer under the judgment of God, the curse of God. We're set free from that penalty, from the curse. And yes, we still sin and repent, but we are set free so that we no longer fear judgment. This is a huge benefit of the gospel. So if you had to boil the doctrine of sin down, what would we say? Number one, we would say uh, that each of us is completely broken, right? Both in our desires and what we do. We sin in more ways than we can count. We have more sin than we're even aware of. But the other part of it is that Christ came to deal with the curse of sin and that we can be set free from it. So there, there is hope. This is not a, a situation where we go, yeah, it's just horrible and awful and we're terrible and horrible and that's it. No, Jesus died for sin so that we might be set free uh, and set free from the curse. So uh, that's the doctrine of sin in a nutshell. There's one other question. You'll have to forgive me. It's been a long day. I want to make sure I, I don't miss anything in my notes. Um, oh, yeah. Question that sometimes asked, did God create evil? Uh, and the answer is no. God did not create evil. God created everything and saw that it was good. Evil entered into the world through our will, through our exercising of, of our will that God gave us. How all that works is a bit of a mystery because, again, we talked about a few weeks ago, God is sovereign over sin. He's not surprised by it. He even works it towards its own ends. Um, but Paul is clear, and the Bible is clear, that God is not the author of evil. Uh, he is not to be charged with sin. Humans sinned. God, in his good purposes, created the world, and it was good. Satan rebelled and fell, and then Adam and Eve rebelled and fell, and we all kind of bear Adam's image. He's the, the, the sometimes called the father of humanity, and we have his image on us, Romans says, that as he sinned, so did we. Sin came into the world through him, and we're all following in his footsteps, every single one of us. 
So uh, if you have questions about the doctrine of sin, please uh, write them in. Let me know. Send me an email, a text, call the church. I'd love to answer them. Be glad to do that. Uh, but that that's the doctrine of sin in a nutshell. Uh, I, I want to close just by making a couple of announcements and, and then praying for us. Uh, number one, uh, you, you know the damage that was brought about by Hurricane Ida. Uh, so uh, Jeff and Sherry Smith's uh, son-in-law is from Pascagoula, Mississippi, and uh, he's just hearing from folks that are having to drive two hours to uh, to get to Walmart because everything is shut down and um, that just damaged beyond belief. And so Jeff and Sherry are uh, collecting gift cards. Uh, if you want to help out folks that are um, sort of suffering from the damage of Hurricane Ida and you want to pick up a Walmart gift card or a gas card or whatever, you can get that to them. You can drop it off by the church. Uh, they would love to give that to Adam, their son-in-law, uh, and he'll, he'll get it to uh, folks who are in need. Uh, also, if you want to um, make a card for the Phoenix City Police Department and drop that off by the church, uh, Harold Barrow is going to be taking some over there um, for, uh, for an appreciation thing that the, uh, the Russell Babs Association is doing. But with that said, uh, let me close us uh, just with a time of prayer uh, for the pandemic and the current situation that we're, we're undergoing. Things uh, are not getting better. Uh, they are getting worse. Uh, hospital numbers are up to 80 uh, there are 25 in the ICU, uh, which I believe is 10 more than EAMC had beds for. Uh, ventilators are up by 10 since two weeks ago. So you'll be getting an update uh, from, from us and the deacons tomorrow, um, uh, talking about what, what that looks like for our church for the next two weeks. Um, but in the meantime, I, I want to read this prayer. Uh, it was written during the Spanish flu epidemic in the United States um, back in the early 1900s. And uh, so we pray with brothers and sisters uh, from years gone by what they prayed when they were besieged by a similar situation. Father, you are merciful and mighty. And during this time of horrific sickness, we flee to you for comfort. Deliver us, we pray, from our peril. Give us strength and give skill to all those who minister to the sick. We pray that you would prosper the means that are used for the care of the sick. We pray that you prosper the means that bring a cure to the sick and grant that given how frail and uncertain our life is, Lord, grant that we would apply our hearts to getting heavenly wisdom, which leads to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Help us to focus on the things that matter. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Till next time, pray that God blesses you. We'll see you on Sunday.